So today, I'm going to share a little bit of our journey. Uh, for those of you that were uh, in this room earlier, this will parallel a little bit what uh, Yana and Robin, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your names, um, where they were probably a year ago is where we are now. Um, so hopefully, it's kind of gives some perspective. And hopefully, if I can come back next year, we'll kind of be in a, uh, further along in the journey. So we'll be talking um, a little bit about uh, our history, um, Agilent's history. I think it's a little relevant here. We have a slightly unique uh, take on how, where we are and where we came from. Um, adapted a lot from, I think uh, we've heard a lot about the Google book in the past um, several days. And we adapt, I adapted quite a bit of it to kind of share and introduce what SRE was. So this is kind of a primer for sort of this is how, do we how did we introduce SRE into our organization. And um, this is, uh, like I said, my first time here. So, so a little bit about me to start out with. Um, I spent the first part of my career at Intel uh, doing some software and hardware, realizing I don't really want to do hardware. So I decided to stay with software. And then I realized I didn't want to do programming anymore. So then I went to Deloitte, uh, did some technology strategy consulting, a lot of M&A, uh, pharmaceutical, the whole kind of whirlwind. And then realized that wasn't for me anymore because I wanted to build product. You know, building those reports were only so, so fun. So we started a product actually uh, in Boston. Uh, we built a small SaaS company uh, serving academic research labs. And then about a year ago, we joined uh, Agilent Technologies. And um, we, we had about 75 people when we joined. Uh, we were a totally virtual organization. About a third of us were on the engineering side. Uh, we serve about 160 uh, academic research hospitals. And we built sort of a workflow system that about 25 to 30,000 people use every day to manage uh, samples and request processing and management. Um, today, I'm the global director of software and cloud operations for one of our largest uh, software divisions at Agilent. So a little bit about Agilent, for those of you that may or may not know, um, we're, and this is relevant for sort of later down in the talk as to sort of why even, forget about SRE, like even the initials AWS didn't mean anything to anybody. So, sort of where we're coming from first, a little bit of a very, very quick history lesson. Um, so in the late 30s, um, Bill Hewlett and David Packard, HP, uh, they formed a partnership and they started HP. They started with oscilloscopes. Um, and you know this is for the movie Fantasia. So I mean, again, this is, we're talking a long time ago. Um, and then in the mid 60s, they entered a partnership and acquired a scientific corporation. And then in 99, at the time, this broke the record for the largest IPO. So uh, we're now a life sciences company, um, about $4.2 billion, um, over 12, 12 to 13,000 employees worldwide. Um, we're a very matrix organization, and that's going to be relevant in terms of how we sort of how I'm learning to navigate and introduce SRE concepts. Um, the other very interesting thing here, which is probably not as relevant for everyone necessarily, is that 95% of our revenue is coming from hardware. So we, you know, we're, we are secretly masquerading as a uh, hardware company, but we're truly a software company. That's what really runs all of our hardware. Um, we're pretty low on the maturity of software delivery, which I'll talk to you about a little bit longer. Uh, we're a very old organization, as you can see. Um, so we have very traditional structures, and it's been sort of a, a story to navigate through all of that. Um, but fantastic leadership structure. Um, many of these executives have been here, it's hard to imagine for maybe some people in the room, but before email existed. So I've been in so many conversations where I'm kind of talking about some of these things, going to cloud, and then I have to remember to myself, they were here like in the mid 80s, early 90s, when email literally didn't exist at a corporation. So that's the kind of sort of a different mindset and framework that we're kind of working through, and it's been a, a very rewarding journey. Um, we're very new to the cloud as a whole, but uh, we recognize it's where we need to be as an organization and just playing uh, competitively in this space. Um, and we're very open to change. So I think having that open dialogue and open communication from the leadership, especially those of you facing similar challenges, can be very, very uh, important when kind of navigating through this journey. Um, and then the other interesting thing is around the hardware is you can't really push releases to hardware every five minutes, right? When you, when you have a hardware sent out to the customer, these are like large machines. Um, some of these machines have been in customer labs for 30 years. And they still work, and the customers don't want to get rid of them. So we have our own hardware refresh problems, but these are in pharmaceutical labs. And it's also provided very interesting challenges for some of our release processes and, and things like that. So that's probably less unique to some people in the room, but um, just some of the parts of my journey. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here, but this is uh, somewhat interesting for parts of what we're going to be talking about. So um, some people, and I've 
pretty sure if uh, Rayana or Robin about, from ING were in the room, they could probably uh, sympathize with me. But we sort of had a central, we have rather, a central IT uh, group. We have sort of what we call a global operations group. And then we have a traditional services and support for our 60,000 customers. And then we have each of our product divisions. And each of our product divisions have their own software and hardware teams. And um, where this becomes challenging is wh where does one think about putting like an SRE concept? And that's one of the first things we kind of faced as one of our challenges. The second thing we faced around some of our challenges was um, our software delivery model. So as, um, and what kind of software do we actually release and have? And as you can see here, just at a very high level, most of our software is actually being dropped at a customer's data center um, you know, you can think of the old style, you know, literally mailing CDs, and actually, uh, I talk about that in a moment. A few of it is being hosted in a server in our data, in our data centers, so that's another thing, right? So we still own our own data centers um, for historical reasons, for regulatory reasons. Um, you know, starting a company again today, and even when we joined uh, Agilent, we would never consider owning, I mean, that's just, the infrastructure cost is ridiculous. Um, and then we're starting to see more and more of the, the true software as a service in the cloud. So how do, we, um, how do we start operating these in a much more, um, really, uh, uh, eloquent manner? Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of our software is uh, released in a very regulated environment. And these are very long uh, release cycles. And today, even today, we're still burning CDs and shipping them to our customers. So you know, forget about cloud and everything else. We're, we're sort of dealing with a whole different world of things that we're slowly migrating to. We're slowly getting, out, getting past that. Uh, again, in this environment, we're releasing software every six to 18 months um, from the desktop uh, perspective. And then you know, just now, we're starting to move the shipping of this software to an online distribution model. Very, I mean, again, this seems like you know, 90s technology, but kind of bringing all that into play here, um, both from our history, but also our customers' histories, they're slowly progressing and joining with us. They, a lot of them have been in similar situations to us, and this is what they expect. But the industry, as everyone here obviously knows, is rapidly, rapidly evolving. Um, and in general, the company, we have a lot of like .NET, Java, C Sharp, kind of very traditional software, uh, you know, historically what I would say traditional software development languages and frameworks, um, and very little customer facing web product experience. So again, this is a, a journey that we're all taking, but, um, and it's been, it's been very rewarding. On the flip side, uh, we, uh, you know, obviously at any startup, we had a Rails, we have a Rails stack. Um, we use, we're, um, I know someone else mentioned some, some words about Slack and HipChat, but we're actually pretty committed to the Atlassian suite. Um, we have um, a lot of New Relic reports happening on us for monitoring. We use that pretty extensively. Uh, we're still trying to evolve into where we should be thinking about going from, you know, you can have a plethora of monitoring tools, and I think there's a talk a little later about that too. Um, we use um, Sentry for error management. Um, Splunk is something that we just introduced. Um, I go back and forth on it, but it's something that uh, at least the Agile IT team is supporting for us. So the more that we can sort of kind of give to a central organization has been uh, helpful from a security and logging perspective. Um, <coughs> we, we manage our own GitLab. Uh, we use another service called Code Climate for um, real-time security uh, code analysis and static, static code analysis. Uh, we use a very interesting SaaS product called Rainforest. If, um, for those of you building web products, it's something I would definitely consider. Uh, we have our whole test suite with Jenkins, but Rainforest is a very uh, innovative product offering that um, provides uh, basically mechanical Turk, for those of you that might be familiar with it, crowdsourced testing on your, on your application. So it's something I'd recommend looking at. And then we have about 20, 25 staging servers. Um, and then we have this all tied up into our customer support system. So, uh, and then so lastly, we have sort of a, what you tr traditionally see a transparent sort of status website. So one of the first things that you know, happened when I joined Agilent, you know, I, as being one of the co-founders, was like, well, you know, I'd, I'm ready to give a lot of some of these pieces away to, well, like, where does my status site go? Where does my, um, where does my centralized logging go? Where does this go? Where does monitoring go? Can I just kind of give that to this team? And lo and behold, there's no team, right? So I'm still doing all this, and it's an opportunity to figure out where do we go from here, and how do we start structuring an organization to be built around that? Um, and then actually, and we are releasing to production twice a week. 
um, to our customers, and even, I, I mean, I think that's slow. I mean, you've, you've heard some talks earlier where they're talking about hundreds or thousands of times a day, and when I say within Agilent, we're doing it twice a week, you know, you saw me earlier say six to 18 months, so t twice a week is a totally different, uh, a different place, but. Um, So we're going to go into, it looks like my thing's not working. So what, um, one of the first things that happened when I joined was we had another product in my division. And um, this was started about a couple of years ago. And it's, you know, for Agile and in general, actually, it's a pretty groundbreaking way of looking at how we're helping analyze instrument logs and instrument information. So it's a very innovative infrastructure from that perspective. A lot of serverless technologies, the latest around Kinesis Firehose and Redshift and so on within the Amazon world. Um, but the team is really good at focusing on product, right? So they, they built this fantastic product. They want to release it in the next, today, like actually in the next several months uh, later this year. Um, but what we noticed is, and they realized also, there's minimal build automation. They haven't really done a lot of release planning. Um, and they're sort of stuck. They recognize this need, but they really need to be focusing on building the product. So, where, where this kind of came to light, really, is that R&D, what we traditionally call our engineering teams R&D, R&D realized that we need this sort of production support manager architect kind of role, right? We, we use contractors today for a lot of different components, but you know, this is where we really realized, and I sort of really recommended, that we can't have um, a contractor come in and kind of rotate through this role. And you know, I think people in the room may recognize why, but we'll talk about that shortly. And um, this is the first real cloud product. So we really recognize that we needed a full dedicated FTE. This is the first real cloud product that Agilent ourselves have been creating. So you know, remember this org chart from before, and we'll, we'll highlight this. But so the first um, idea was, put it in the product division, right? Because we, we know the most about it, we need to know it, you know, that who else can really support it? But we've been burned in the past, the team's been burned in the past, they're trying to provide the production support while also building the actual product, and I think most of you are probably familiar with that. Um, Central IT, in our case, didn't really ha doesn't really have customer-facing product uh, support experience. They do a lot with the internal systems like SAP and the web and the store, but they're not really dealing with a lot of this customer, this emerging customer facing product world. And our traditional support organization, these are literally field service engineers going to sites, fixing equipment with, you know, wrenches and so on. And um, they're not, they don't have this sort of technical expertise either. So the idea before you know, I was brought into this picture was let's open it in this global ops. So this is like a nightmare, right? So I, I, I saw this and we're, like, I'm, this is why I have no hair anymore, in fact, because we're, we're trying to see like, what is actually going on. How do, we, how do we do this? Because we have people from all over trying to do all sorts of different things. So what I did using some of my consulting background is really just trying to understand, okay, so who, who do we need to convince that this kind of organization, an SRE kind of thing, something that I was familiar with in philosophy, but not really necessarily practical terms, but how we get there. So first we needed to identify, you know, we just went over all the background. Then we're trying to identify and really figure out who are the people within the organization that matter and will, could be influential in this process. Um, then slowly come up with what the right proposal might be. So try to understand who um, and what, and we'll talk about that, and then finally the results and where we are. Um, and then as practicing, as, w as many of us learn, and continuous improvement not only in the software side, but also on the organization and the culture side. So this is you know, the first step in that process, and we hope to continue to innovate and keep going from here. So back to our org chart. So we, you know, what I had to try to figure out is across all these places, who has the vested interest to figure out, tell me, who, who, who can we really, who do we need to be working with? Um, we have people in the typical computing. We have our team in our network office or information security. Like I talked about, we have some people in what we call global ops infrastructure. Again, this is like this mega org, Borg kind of thing that we're dealing with. And then we have our regional support places. So 
you know, where, where do you go? You really go to the top of all these places, right? So we go to our CIO, we go to the VPs of our divisions, we go to the VPs, again, this is sort of very antithesis to any sort of startup, but kind of very, I think this, this kind of structure is probably not very uncommon in a traditionally large, you know, 12,000 person organization, um, especially one as old as ours. Um, and one thing I'll say is anytime sort of you're going through some sort of like culture shift or introducing something new like this, um, this executive buy-in, no surprise, is key. So I, I think we heard that earlier also. I don't recall which one, but there was, um, yeah, actually she mentioned it again in, in Intercom to some degree, but we, you just need to kind of keep pushing the agenda and realizing you know, who the right influential people are. So what is SRE? We're all, we all pretty much know what SRE is, but I'll, I'll give another primer here. Um, so the first thing that executives like, and in general what you're gonna be doing is the business case, right? So why, why do we wanna even introduce SRE? What, what, is, what are we gonna get from this? Um, ultimately, there's the economic value, but there's also sort of the philosophical and practical values of some of these things. Um, so like we said, just to recap, some of the problems we were having is that you know, R&D is forced to build product, but at the same time you're forced to sort of organize and manage the product that you just delivered. And there are different schools of thought on that. You know, I think you know, as we're evolving as an organization, we'll be introducing things like error budgets and trying to understand like, where do you start and stop and fall. But I think everyone here can agree on the fact that you know, if you're building your product, you can't, generally speaking, although I've heard some different uh, views this morning, around monitoring the same thing you're building. I think that works probably in, in different kinds of organizations. In this case, we're, we're kind of at least divorcing that aspect uh, temporarily in the short term. Um, what I also learned as I'm navigating through this is that disparate resources across the organization could be doing similar things. Like not everyone should be creating their own monitoring tool for their own web service or web product, or not everyone should be kind of creating their own logging server to kind of figure this out for themselves. So what we learned is there's actually efficiency, unsurprisingly, to kind of work across and learn and try to figure it out. Um, especially with such a matrixed and diverse organization as ours, 12,000 people across, I think, 40 countries, um, customers in over 100 countries, it's, it's not like the easiest, like everyone raise your hand if you're an SRE person. It's hard to kind of identify all these people, but slowly but surely you'll kind of meet these. Um, in, in our case also, I think this is probably a legacy thing, especially through some of the early 2000s and the late 2000s um, in terms of some of the financial difficulties. Um, contractor hiring was very, very prevalent. They, we use contractors as a way to sort of augment the workforce. They're, temp they're by definition expendable from one perspective, they're temporary. So using them as sort of a means to augment some of this stuff. But what happened was, and, we've, and unsurprisingly again, is that they, the turnover, when the turnover is high, you lose institutional knowledge and you start coming, starting all over again. So having that can be very challenging, especially in this kind of org. And then, um, but having said all of that, the actual system needs engineering resources. You can't just kind of send this to some non-engineering or non-technical resource. So how do you kind of balance all of those things? So my idea and our concept here was let's introduce SRE, of course. So with, with that in mind, what we can say is that R&D can now focus on priorities. Um, we can try to start introducing knowledge sharing across the organization. Um, we, we definitely recommend full-time employees because of all the reasons we just talked about. The more full-time employees you have, you know, you start introducing the fall of the sun and things like that, so how do we get there? And then one of the things I read actually from, a, I think it was a talk Lassian gave a few years ago, is rotating R&D resources into the SRE organization. Uh, because again, that innate product knowledge is so important when you're building out some, any sort of production monitoring or things like that. So what follows is a few slides, and actually I should have mentioned this um, for those taking some notes, even in here. Uh, I have this small um, tag in the bottom right, which might be hard to see, but these are the, it, it says used in selling SRE internally. Um, these are literally examples, and I think relevant here also, these are the kinds of diagrams and discussions and presentations that I gave, and these, the ones with the gray, um, notes are the slides that I pretty much gave verbatim when we were kind of doing, going through this journey inside, um, the, inside, the, uh, inside our organization. So um, today, as we all know, because we're all here, we're, SRE is effectively now an industry accepted practice. Like I said, these initials, these acronyms were all brand new. 
Um, AWS, like I said, was just a brand new thing. Um, we, as an Agilent, we just had three SaaS acquisitions. We're entering the space more aggressively. Um, several divisions, not unsurprisingly, want to be introducing several uh, cloud-based products, hiring for similar, similar roles themselves. So let's start incubating, incubating some sort of centralized approach. And what I also tried, to, without going into a lot of detail, we kind of talked about, well, we're sort of this whole spectrum of operating a, a product or a software, right? So you have your traditional system administrators. They're usually within IT, traditionally, right? You're kind of doing your OS patching, doing your network monitoring, those kinds of stuff. Um, you have, sometimes you have your dedicated admins where they, um, you have, you know, your one IT guy for your product because you just rolled it out and it needs to go on and so forth. And then, um, again, with smaller companies, I'd say, due to product complexity, you're going to have your R&D teams dedicate people, which is where my team was, where two of our other acquisitions recently were, and to some degree, we're going to be interested in new products. Um, but then, as several of you here know, um, you know, having these groups tightly integrated within the organizations, but it's different sort of mindset and mission is really where, I was, where we're really trying to push. We're not there yet, but this is where I started the journey here. Sort of, I was trying to frame us where we are in this whole space and where we could be going. So, you know, we're not necessarily going to be the next, the next Netflix, but there's no reason why one can't aspire to be like that, even though you're not a traditional software company. And again, SRE was this foreign, foreign term. So what I was also trying to do here is really convince the difference, and again, this might be a, a no-brainer for several of you, but it's, SRE is very different from a traditional IT resource. Right? And really building consensus, show what other industries are doing, really helps to make that case out. Um, we relied a lot from the Google book, and there's a whole talk later, I think one of the birds of the feather this, this evening, from one of the authors. So I definitely recommend for those of you, A, for those of you that haven't read it, read it. Um, and for those of you that, uh, and I'll go through parts of it, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Um, one of the key things here, though, is that what we were trying to really out, outlay to, the, to our team is that the SRA team runs production services, right? And specifically, we run them for our customers. And that, that's the one distinction I really tried to make over and over again, because you have an IT org, they're doing a lot of things like I talked about, but it's just a different mindset when you come and you're running systems for customers. Um, the other piece is around just continuing, continuous improvement of health. Um, I started to introduce this concepts of R&D toil. Again, that was a little bit foreign um, to help increase uh, R&D velocity, um, which, again, people like to hear that, right? If you're going to get more product out because you're reducing their distractions, that's always going to be something that goes over well. And then when SREs engage, we're really the idea is to improve across all of these services, uh, across all of these elements, um, and try to figure out the right way to kind of do each of these things. Again, from our friends at Google, um, and actually this was, a, we just learned the hierarchy of needs here. Um, but then what, we, what I tried to do here also on the right is take a slightly different you know, translation of these things. What does this mean? What is the business really going to be gaining from these different levels of when an SRE comes to play, right? So you know, we're always monitoring. We're starting to go across different dimensions, different service level, service level objectives. Um, try to figure out this whole on-call system. We didn't really have that in place today, at least, again, for customers, uh, customer facing. We did a lot of um, product-based or contractor-based on-call related, but they didn't have the full tier three level support. Um, this root cause and efficiency, going through the whole post-mortem analysis. Um, the release and testing, that's something else that, you know, again, it's, it's new, right? We have these big Java packages. How are we going to release it? Um, I should mention that the example that we're even talking about here, you know, there wasn't, when we started engaging with the team now, we've sort of formed a mini SRE team, team now. It's the end of the story. But, you know, trying to automate the releases, automate the building the environments in the cloud, like this whole team that had built it did a really good job building it, but now when we tried to rebuild it, it was just a disaster. Like, you know, no one had documented everything. So just kind of having these things in mind. Um, obviously, continuing the monitoring practice, you know, trying to do the scale, load, capacity planning. Um, and then really, the whole outcome, obviously, is this whole happy product, right? So if you have all of these things going on down here, the idea is that you're going to get this really happy product, really happy customer in the whole end state. So again, things that you want to be hearing, you want to be sharing uh, customer-focused uh, messages 
is something that, again, I've heard and, and really espoused quite a bit when trying to navigate and go through this, uh, go through this journey. Um, the other part is really stressing the importance, not only is SRE really, and again, as we all know, not only is SRE doing at the end, but we also are doing things throughout the life cycle, right? So we need to be collaborating not only with the R&D and engineering teams, but as we grow, and this is where I'd like to be, I'm not, I, I can honestly say we're not here yet, is really appreciating and understanding and going through the journey of the product release through every step. I think I've heard a lot of good talks today and yesterday about sort of this active part at the end, but I can't stress enough, and again, I, I share this uh, within the broader uh, Agile community, that we as SREs really need to be involved from the beginning. If, if we get engaged at the end on a product, you're, you're left generally, and I've seen this from experience, you're left with a, a mini disaster that you're trying to, you, you want to get out the door, but then you're also really trying to figure it out. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes here just because um, I thought this was <coughs> Excuse me, useful. So, you know, obviously the engineering product marketing teams, they're, um, they're, they're key, and, you know, this doesn't even begin to represent sort of the, the uh, volume of their work or the investment on their side. But, um, you know, they're helping to design the work, uh, design the scope, build the requirements. But at the same time, this is when you really need to start the SRE engagement, right? So you need to be there right when they're doing this summer stuff. If someone says, Okay, we're going to be uh, we're going to write an, uh, a welcome email uh, action. You know, when a person logs in first time, they're going to get a welcome email, or when they register. So then, the first question you should ask is, well, are you going to send 10,000, 100,000? What's your forecast? What, what you, are you even ready for this? You know, we had this problem where we were sending thousands of emails, and suddenly our mail server died because we, were, you know, we just it evolved over time, and suddenly we were sending 100,000. We didn't even know it. And now we're sending half a million per month, and we just had we weren't even monitoring it. So start defining and providing this input early on in this uh, early on here. Um, and then the key, again, in this, in this design phase is to minimize these future, uh, future disputes, right? Every choice you have in the beginning, every design choice will have reciprocal effects towards the end. So provided we can engage early in the process, you can have that impact early where it's not really a big deal. Oh, just can you add a quick monitoring flag for this or can you just make sure you're really scaling here? Um, as you're building, be right there, be involved. Uh, you know, they're building the product, but you should also be there in these scrums, right? You should be there checking, well, wait, we have these things, let's, let's kind of think about it. Did these SLOs, SLAs, did they, did they make sense? Did the metrics that we wanted to measure, did they make sense? Um, but just confirm, be, be as part of that process, right? You know, we're, we're building alongside the R&D team, and it's so important to be going throughout the journey and the process with them. And the key here, again, is as SREs, we're gonna gain operational knowledge of this product. We can start be thinking ahead and say, oh wow, they're using like 15 different microservices. Let's make sure we have either resources on the team, let's start learning along while they're learning. You know, again, just kind of without getting this thing dumped to you, dumped at the end. And then the real key is where we start ramping up a little bit more is around the release cycle, right? So, you know, they're, the, the R&D product team, they're working on it, validating it, QA, their go-to-market strategy, you know, the product support, all that sort of stuff. Um, but then, you know, we're here. We want to be releasing, you know, how do we want to be releasing? Do you want to release just a, you know, feature A? you want to do some A-B testing? Do you want to automate the whole thing? You were releasing 10 times a day, once a month, twice a year. Um, and that way, if we're here right alongside this process, when, you, when we jump in as SREs, we can keep this R&D momentum. They can keep focusing on new enhancements, new features, new bugs when they come in, but we're there kind of right alongside, and that, that journey gliding right through, I think can have a really positive impact when, when going through this process. Um, and then obviously where we really step in now is this post-release, right? So, you know, we're gonna send them, we're gonna be monitoring the error budgets, um, monitoring pretty much everything we possibly can, hopefully within reason. I think there was a good talk yesterday morning around over-monitoring, and that's obviously a problem. I think I can, I can relate to that. But, um, you know, providing all that feedback up and prioritizing, <coughs> excuse me, prioritizing and giving that feedback in so that, again, we're iterating and going through this cycle. So um, again, in the book, uh, in, the, in the book, the Google book, there is um, the other thing that's really important here is that um, this SRE engagement, especially as you get to scale, we're, we're nowhere near that, but in, a, in an organization that's fortunate enough to have you know, hundreds or ten, tens or hundreds of products, SRE can't be there for everybody. So um, there's a philosophy within in the Google book described as the production readiness review 
um, where they really understand the reliability needs, the SLAs, the SSLOs, and then they'll decide, well, your, your product's great, but you don't need SRE, or it's too expensive to engage SRE, let's kind of figure out the right model there. So that way you, you kind of think about, you, know, you have a process in place to uh, consider when, or when you want to engage as a team, as an SRE team. Um, we're trying to basically say around scale, complexity, and business value are sort of the metrics that I'm starting to introduce. If you kind of meet all those three criteria, then yeah, let's do all these things. Let's, you know, you're going to get the full bang of everything. So back to our fun org chart. Um, so you know, we heard about all of these things, and we were like, well, what, now what do we do? So I said, well, it doesn't actually make sense to kind of put them in any of the things that you described. So we're going to incubate our own. We're going to create another organization. Well, so we, so for now, in fact, what we decided to do is let's let's build out this SRE resource. Let's consolidate the people that we can, um, and bring other like-minded people. And let's focus on our division, the division that we're introducing that case study in first. Service on our own, and slowly bring in other product divisions. Then eventually, and we're still on this journey, figure out where can we go or where should we go. Um, and focusing on our division first. Um, in terms of staffing it, <coughs> we want to really bring in, like I said, we have, today we have about four permanent team members, uh, three of which actually I was fortunate enough to bring here, so they're spread out, luckily they're not watching this talk. Um, and, and also the other thing I'm really trying to do is actually rotate and uh, bring, uh, just bring one team member within the software organization into the SRE team. So call it a three-month rotation, call it a six-month rotation. Um, the key here is that, you know, as we know, SRE is not just this knock center, right? Sock, knock, it's not that. We're truly automating, we're building. You know, I think someone also said, if you've automated everything, you have no job, you know, come talk to me kind of thing. That, that's half true. You want to be continuing to improve, continue to build. Everything you see, you look at as opportunity. You're not just sort of, you know, whack a mole everything. So... The good, the, the success story here um, is that we, uh, we, we got approval to go through that process. And again, going through this step, you know, that whole journey, and you know, back when I was a startup and I sort of did everything, I could have said, well, yes, this is what we're doing. But now that you're in a larger, or that now I was in a large, I am in a larger organization, you kind of have to go through a little bit of that process. And some of the thinking, you know, can be time consuming, but some of it, you know, that planning process becomes uh, extremely important. So. Um, I have a few sort of around the things around lessons learned here, but one is um, educating these R&D teams, engaging SRE um, is, is really good, you know, right? Having a structure, having a way to sort of espouse it, evangelize it within the organization, um, you know, reviewing a lot of these slides that I talked about, you know, I'm, I share that a lot now. I talk probably every few weeks to the next new person, and really for two reasons. One is to make sure that they're not rebuilding something. So, you know, we don't have these different SRE pockets necessarily growing within the organization, trying to reinvent their own stuff. Um, and then right now what we're doing is kind of working on, like I said, this build automation, release management, production release process. Um, there's a whole talk about hiring later by Chris in this room. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but when we go through our hiring process, um, we've done a couple now. You know, we're looking for the software engineering fit. Uh, I'm curious to hear Chris's talk, but actually he says it's impossible to hire SRE, if I'm not mistaken, which, you know, I think a lot of people, oh yeah, so hiring SREs maybe literally be impossible. Um, testament to the people in the room. But I think, um, you know, we looked for a penchant for automation, um, and we did case studies. So we actually gave them incidents that just happened. You know, we talked about database scaling. We talked about these kinds of things. We, we walked through different case studies and their scenarios. Uh, remember, we're a global and a virtual organization, so we did a lot of these via Google Chats. We did a lot of, um, we still do a lot of the on-the-fly coding assignments just to kind of get a sense of basic alg algorithmic uh, technical uh, aspects and things like that. <clears throat> um, this is a tough one, and again, this will only really be appreciated by the people that are in large organizations, but this IT organization concept it, it, it's there, right? We're not getting rid of end user computing. Everyone has their own PCs. If you have a Mac, your probably IT department's really small. But, you know, where, where as more products are moving to the cloud, the, the role of an IT organization starts to evolve with it. Um, and having said that, you know, you're still going to have these massive ERPs, generally in house, especially for regulated companies like ourselves. 
Um, but it's important to kind of build the right team and set these expectations as we're evolving. And it's happening quickly. You know, I can tell from my experience, I mean, you saw we're a 50 plus year old company effectively at our roots. And some of the changes that we're seeing even in the past 18 months are just rapidly having. So, you know, our headquarters are in Santa Clara. You know, I can literally, you know, see the Apple spaceship from our windows. It's, it's, you know, we're in this environment that is causing us to really be rethinking and evolving. And, you know, you don't want to jump too far ahead because, you know, you can only go as far as you can. But you also want to make sure that you're evolving to the things that stay competitive. Um, this has been a little bit challenging, identifying our other SRE slash DevOps. I'm using that sort of interchangeably for the moment, but you know, eventually I want to be uh, expanding and involving that. Um, it can be difficult to identify across large organizations, like I said. Like going through, you know, there aren't really necessarily meetups within our group. Like I said, we're spread out so globally. Uh, we have software as decentralized, IT to you know, different, different groups. Um, but you know, one place I've found is you know, we have centralized all of our AWS, obviously, hopefully, obviously, into one account. So I've gone there to find out who else is using AWS in the organization. So things like that, looking for central points of contact that might provide other places, uh, again, for those of you in that similar challenges. Um, and these benefits are huge. I, I, just, I was on a call a few, uh, few weeks ago where we learned about uh, someone that had been doing a lot with cloud formation scripts that we just had no idea it was even happening. So again, leveraging the knowledge within the companies especially large organizations, can be invaluable. Um, and lastly, this, this SRE, um, now that we're here, we're like this huge shiny toy, right? We're like amazing. Everyone wants us. Everyone's like, well, SRE can do everything now. You know, you're the panacea. You've, you, you know, you've saved us. You can solve all of our problems. Um, the business groups are realizing that this SRE group that we're trying to form is actually really interesting, and it, it can help us a little bit. But we're, you know, we're not the group doing server. Like I've, I've now gotten a lot of requests. Can I just add headcount to your team? Can I do this instead? Can I do that instead? Um, and trying to find the right places to put that boundaries are really important, right? So this is something I still struggle with and trying to find the right place. I mean, some places also, some business groups are excited to use us, use us, the SRE team, because they might see a little bit more nimbleness than you might see in a traditional organization as well. So again, really defining those boundaries is, I, I can't stress enough, uh, is gonna be really important. Okay, finally. So where are we uh, ending up here? So one of the things that I'm trying to wrap up is, um, you know, we're, we're on this journey right now, we're early in this journey, where I try to identify a more permanent home for SRE, um, trying to figure out, is it, does it belong in a business group? Is it a brand new org? Does it fall within IT? You know, if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to hear them because you know, I've, I've heard a lot of schools have thought of how that works at a, at a company our size, I should say. Um, you know, we're, we're not quite there around this DevOps, SRE, um, who does CICD, who does release automation, who does the monitoring, where does your IT org step in, you know, who's doing the network monitoring, how do they fit in the security log monitoring, how do they fit in? Um, you have a lot of established processes, but you want to bring them into play here. Um, you know, the SRE team today, my team members, they have specific product responsibilities, so I can't swap them all out individually, which is, you know, which I think to a degree is going to be happening no matter what, because the products are so different. But I'd like to do some, uh, some, some cross-training so that you have, you know, at least my five guys can, five team members can do some minimal cross-support, you know, again, with some automation and documentation there, introducing run books. <coughs> Um, we're working on setting up 24-7 incident management, um, follow the sun, hopefully, model. Um, and then as we mature, hopefully moving some of these. I, I, one of the talks earlier today had some good advice on you know, moving some of this back into the business. Uh, we're definitely not there yet, because we're just trying to sort of establish some practices here, but kind of do that. Um, we have a lot of dashboards. We use New Relic a lot, as you saw, but I'm getting sort of stats from all over the place. So how do we build something? that has the right level of information that we can sort of jump on at the right time. And then really setting managing error budgets, the SLO process, um, something that we're um, gonna be introducing soon because again, just kind of giving that transparency and visibility just becomes so important back to business products. And lastly, I, I've talked a lot about lessons throughout, but just to summarize, um, especially in large organizations, and you know, for those of you again uh, facing similar challenges, challenging the status quo is okay. Just because something's being done a certain way doesn't mean it has to be done that way in the future. These new concepts are coming. Large organizations are here to move; they're not here to go. You know, 
GE's been around since the late 1800s. They're not going anywhere. So these organizations are here for a reason. Um, so it's really important that the future leaders like ourselves are really there in there introducing new concepts and getting and building that momentum. Um, as you can see, understanding the org structure is critical. Understanding the influencing decision makers. Um, there was a good uh, mention of it, I think again, Yana and Robin's talk earlier. Knowing who to go to for what um, just becomes evangelists. You know, now we have people sort of communicating the different roles and talking about these kinds of things. Um, you just need to be aligning this executive support. I've learned a lot about that, and I think that's been really valuable, both because you can communicate around these things, and change is possible, like you saw. Like, we're, we're definitely moving forward in that path. Um, you saw the business case structure that we're using. Again, describing things in terms of the business benefits um, becomes a, a lot more translatable and understandable and relatable, especially when you're talking at the executive level. And these setting boundaries. This is where I'm literally facing right now, is trying to figure out which you know, where, where do we stop? Where does the next group start? What do we not do? Um, again, love to hear some advice on that, but trying to figure out how do we kind of go through that. And just communication's key. You know, I think the more people know what you're doing within the organization, the more people can help you, and the more people that I'm learning now can help you make sure they're not doing the same thing, so we're not replicating things like that. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you. This is my first time to Dublin as well, so I hope to get a chance to visit the city, and thank you again to uh, Usenext for sponsoring and uh, having me talk to you guys.